Well, hey guys, in today's video, I'm gonna talk about a major reason you should protect your skin from the sun through the use of sunscreen and sun protective clothing. And that is a skin cancer called basal cell carcinoma. Skin cancer is the most common cancer diagnosis in the United States. There are three major types of skin cancer that we think of and that we see commonly. The first two are basal cell carcinoma, which I'll talk about in today's video, as well as squamous cell carcinoma. These two skin cancers, basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, are lumped together in a category called non-melanoma skin cancers. This is to distinguish them from the third skin cancer, melanoma. Melanoma is a deadly form of skin cancer. In contrast, the non-melanoma skin cancers are very treatable and curable. So that is to distinguish the two. There are many other types of skin cancer. It's not just these three, but those are the three major categories. And in today's video, like I said, I'm just gonna focus on basal cell carcinoma. And the United States, there are probably over 3 million diagnoses of non-melanoma skin cancer on an annual basis. And of those, 80% are basal cell carcinomas. So it's the most common skin cancer that we see in the United States, and it's also incredibly common worldwide as well. Basal cell carcinoma is a type of skin cancer that arises in the cells at the basal layer of the epidermis of your skin. The epidermis is the top of your skin, and it consists of a stack of cells. And the top stack of the cells is a type of cell called squamous cells, and then the very bottom layer is a small band of cells called basal cells. And they are actually what separates your epidermis, the top layer of the skin, from the dermis, the bottom layer. They're right there at the junction between the two layers of the skin. Basal cell carcinoma arises within those cells. Basal cell carcinoma, um, while it is not a skin cancer that metastasizes readily or spreads to other areas of the body, it can be locally very invasive. And what that means is that the skin cancer cells, once they form in those basal cells, can infiltrate into the surrounding skin and almost put out little roots. Basal cell carcinoma is kind of like a weed in your garden, if you can think of it that way. Um, it, it puts out little tiny roots and can really just take up a lot of real estate on, say for example, the skin of your face. Basal cell carcinoma is the result of cumulative lifetime exposure to ultraviolet radiation, as well as other things that mutate the DNA in those skin cells. Both exogenous factors that cause mutations, like ultraviolet radiation, as well as just spontaneous mutations, bad luck, and genetics. Ultraviolet radiation as well as tobacco and pollutants and ionizing radi radiation are all factors that can contribute to mutations in these cells. And throughout your lifetime, the accumulation of those mutations ends up in the formation of a skin cancer called basal cell carcinoma. And some individuals are going to be at greater risk for developing these. They're more common in people who are very fair complexion, who have blonde or red hair and blue eyes. They're also much more common in people who have had a history of being on a medication that lowers their immune system or that have a disease that lowers their immune system like HIV. Uh, basal cell carcinomas, while they are more common in people with a fair skin type, they can and do occur in darker skin types as well. People who have a history of a chronic wound or a scar are also at increased risk for basal cell carcinoma in the affected area uh, because that chronic inflammation leads to the accumulation of these mutations that with time can result in basal cell carcinoma. The sun exposure that you have in early childhood is actually thought to be more responsible for the risk of basal cell carcinoma than sun exposure that you have in later, in later adult years. Basal cell carcinoma takes a long time to manifest or to have its onset, so that's what's referred to as a latency period. Ultraviolet radiation uh, from the sun, as well as tanning beds, and even those seemingly innocent uh, UV lamps that they use in nail salons to harden your nail shellac all can contribute. A history of a blistering sunburn in childhood is a risk factor for the development of basal cell carcinoma. 
Some people are more sun sensitive than others. So if you are fair, if you have a fair complexion, blonde hair or red hair or blue eyes, you are at an increased risk for, for basal cell carcinoma. That's who, who develops these skin cancers most commonly. But that's not to say that people with darker skin types, such as African Americans, don't develop basal cell carcinoma either. And ultraviolet radiation is not the only factor that plays a role in the accumulation of these mutations. Uh, other risk factors include a chronic wound or chronic uh, injury site, a chronic non-healing wound, for example, on the lower legs, can predispose you to basal cell carcinoma. It's that chronic inflammation and irritation uh, can disturb the cells of the basal, basal layer and uh, lead, to, lead to fueling the fire for a basal cell carcinoma. Also certain autoimmune uh, skin diseases, namely lupus of the skin, is a skin disease uh, that's related to the immune system, and that skin disease is associated with an increased risk of basal cell carcinoma, particularly in the areas affected by the skin disease. And then also, in, in terms of other factors, uh, if you have a history of being on a medicine that lowers your immune system, that can also, also play a role. And the reason for that is that the medicines lower your immune system's ability to recognize these cells that have mutations early and get rid of them. So being on an immunosuppressive medication or um, if you have a disease or a medical condition that lowers your immune system, such as HIV, that too is a risk factor for basal cell carcinoma. Classically, this skin cancer is seen most often in older Caucasian males, although women definitely get this as well. Um, and now we're seeing it in younger and younger adults and we're seeing it in young women in particular. If you have a history of being of using a tanning bed, that is a major risk factor because of the ultraviolet radiation exposure that you get through the tanning bed. And then there are some genetic diseases in which there are inherited gene defects that uh, predispose the individual to forming these basal cell carcinomas. For example, there's one called Gorlin syndrome, which also goes by the name basal cell nevus syndrome. And then lastly, in terms of risk factors, Having a basal cell carcinoma is a risk factor for having another basal cell carcinoma. It puts you at increased risk. And you can imagine why. The basal cell carcinoma that we see and it presents on your skin, uh, that's only what we can see on the surface. But there are all of these abnormal cells underneath lurking and those are kind of primed to then go on to form a basal cell carcinoma. So you are at increased risk, uh, especially if you think of things like cumulative exposure to ultraviolet radiation from the sun in early childhood. Uh, you know, the chances are it wasn't just a spot, spot sunburn that you got right in that one area. It's probably all over and you've got those mutations lurking under the skin. Uh, so having, a, having one diagnosis of a basal cell carcinoma is a risk factor for getting another one somewhere else. But what does basal cell carcinoma look like? It actually can look like a lot of things. That's kind of one of the most scary things about it. Uh, most commonly it presents as a red, smooth, shiny bump. Almost looks like a little firm pimple or cyst. Uh, and it grows very slowly, so it's not the kind of thing that erupts suddenly overnight. And with time, it can develop what's called a rolled border, so kind of a, a, a smooth uh, little, little perimeter, almost like a donut type border around it. I'll try and insert a photo of that here as well so you can get some idea of it. All the uh, basal cell carcinomas, they uh, also will have sometimes what's called telangiectasias or big dilated blood vessels that you can see on the surface. They can ulcerate, uh, which means kind of break open and scab over. They can spontaneously bleed. And they also can start to change uh, colors, show different colors like brown, black, and develop pigment. It also can be a flat, scaly red uh, plaque that uh, looks, for all intents and purposes, like eczema or maybe psoriasis. Uh, that's another very common way that it will present on the skin. And uh, a less common way, but a more concerning way, is it actually can present looking like a scar, and that is called morpheiform basal cell carcinoma. It looks like a white, shiny scar, and that type is, tends to be a more locally invasive, so much so that it can invade the little nerves in your skin and cause some symptoms like numbness, tingling uh, in the face, and even pain. Uh, it's what's called perineural invasion. Those tumor cells can start to invade the surrounding nerves. It's typically um, detected clinically on a skin exam, 
uh, but some symptoms that might cause you to bring it to the attention of your treating healthcare provider are, say, a classic history would be a red bump that comes up and doesn't go away, or a pimple that won't go away, a cut that won't heal, uh, a little kind of scabby thing that you keep picking at, it bleeds and heals over. Those are actually kind of suggestive features of a, of a skin cancer such as basal cell carcinoma. So as always, any, anything that pops up on your skin that is new, changing, uncomfortable, uh, just doesn't look right to you, tell your doctor, tell your doctor right away. Uh, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry. So what are some complications of having a basal cell carcinoma? Well, I already alluded to the fact that it's pretty rare that it would ever metastasize to other areas of the body. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, that basically just means a cancer starts out in one area and one organ system of your body and spreads to another. That doesn't typically happen with basal cell carcinoma, although there are rare, rare exceptions. And uh, so, you know, that's not, not as much of a concern, but the longer, the longer it goes untreated, the more little roots that it puts out and therefore the harder it is to get out and the more likely it is to recur after it has been treated, the longer you go uh, un untreated and undiagnosed. So better, better prognosis, better outcome if it's treated early when the basal cell carcinoma is small. The other obvious risk is going to be a scar after treatment. I'll have to get into the different types of treatment. And uh, also uh, poor wound healing, skin infections. Those are more complications of the treatment. So let's get into the treatment. The first type of treatment is something called excision, which is basically a skin surgery that involves cutting out the tumor and closing it back up together with either stitches or allowing it to heal by what's called secondary intent, meaning just, just heal on its own, let new skin come, come into the area. Uh, excision has a pretty high cure rate and a fairly low recurrence rate. It depends on the size of the tumor and the location as to whether or not excision is an appropriate treatment. When a basal cell carcinoma undergoes excision as the treatment, uh, the dermatologist, we have to take a sufficient amount of normal, normal appearing tissue from around the tumor. So what may seem like a small bump, we actually still have to take out a pretty big hole. There has to be a margin of anywhere from three to five millimeters of normal appearing skin that is excised at the same time. After the tumor is cut out, it is sent to a pathologist who looks at it under the microscope to see if there is any more tumor remaining at the edges and the borders. And if the edges and the borders are clear, that is considered treated. But sometimes they're not clear and more surgery needs to be done. So a risk of excision is inadequate uh, removal or risk of recurrence. Second type of treatment is called Mohs micrographic surgery. And it actually has a very high cure rate and it is used for uh, skin cancers that are in high risk areas like the head, certain areas of the head and neck, certain sizes, maybe in certain patients who have a history of being immunosuppressed or in patients who have had recurrences or on immunosuppressive medications. So there are a lot of criteria for what type of basal cell carcinoma undergo this type of treatment. Um, but if, if the basal cell carcinoma needs to have that, what it involves is examining um, excisions layer by layer of the tumor to check very carefully uh, for clear, clear margins. So instead of just taking this wide margin uh, as in an excision, you go little bit by little bit and look at each little bit until you have until you have those bits that are clear of tumor. So it's tissue sparing, in other words. The third type of treatment is more superficial and reserved for very small uh, basal cells that uh, are, are low risk. And that's gonna be either a shave excision, which instead of actually cutting out the tumor into the deeper layers and stitching it up, uh, it just involves shaving it flat off. Uh, you know, you kind of take a little scoop of the base to make sure you get that basal layer. Um, so that's one way or another more superficial uh, skin surgery that can be done on certain basal cell carcinomas is something called electrodesiccation and curatage, which basically involves scraping the tumor out and burning the base. Whether it be a shave excision or electrodesiccation and curatage, both of these more superficial surgeries are nice in that you don't have stitches and uh, you know it's it's much it's much quicker of a procedure, but there is a higher rate rate of recurrence of the tumor coming back. In other words, and you're also left with a scar. So depending on the 
tumor features as well as the location for aesthetic reasons, uh, it may not be appropriate. The fourth type of treatment is liquid nitrogen freezing spray. This also is only appropriate for very small uh, lesions and sometimes is used alongside other treatments, but it involves freezing the tumor cells uh, and that freezing uh, then results in the cells thawing and, and kind of dying, uh, for lack of a better word. The fifth type of treatment is something called photodynamic therapy, and this involves applying onto the skin a photosensitizing uh, chemical uh, that, that is taken up by the skin cancer cells preferentially, uh, and once that is done, once that's taken up, then the, the patient is exposed to light, visible light, and because those cancer cells have taken up that, that chemical, uh, they're very sensitive to light and they die. Um, is the is the idea, but it's it can be very helpful for more uh, local lesions, smaller lesions, and it also has a very good cosmetic outcome in that you don't you don't have any scarring and it almost kind of gives you a secondary uh, face. It's almost like a, an intensive facial because uh, it'll remove uh, some just sun damaged skin cells as well. The sixth type of treatment is a cream called Imiquimod or Aldera. This is a medication in a cream form that actually uh, makes your immune system rev up and come in and hopefully clear out the tumor. Again, more superficial lesions that are gonna be less than two centimeters in diameter. Those would be you know, potentially appropriate for this treatment. The tumor becomes very inflamed uh, and then uh, it heals and it heals with minimal scarring. The seventh type of treatment is uh, a cream called Effidex or 5-fluorouracil. This is again going to be only appropriate for very small tumors and it is applied twice a day for 6 to 12 weeks and uh, it, it has a much higher recurrence rate than other treatments that I've talked about but it is an option. And then the eighth type of treatment is something called radiation therapy. Um, this is basically like x-ray treatment of the tumor cells. Um, and this is most often used either as a primary treatment in cases of uh, basal cell carcinoma where surgery is just not in the patient's best interest, uh, particularly very, very elderly individuals who may be a little frail, too frail for the procedure. Uh, this, this is something that is considered but it's also used as an adjuvant treatment, meaning it's used alongside surgery, particularly for stubborn, uh, stubborn basal cell carcinomas that are really invasive into the surrounding skin. Uh, sometimes radiothera radiation therapy is used as an adjuvant treatment. Um, and it's not something that is really appropriate for young people. It does have uh, risks of predisposing actually to skin cancer down the road. So it's something that is used more uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Basal cell carcinoma is, for the most part, curable and you know not not something that people die from. But there are advanced cases for sure, and some you know it's not not out of the woods to to have to have a multimodal approach to treatment using a combination of surgery and radiation therapy in really advanced cases. We also now have medications that target some of these mutations that occur in basal cell carcinoma, namely a medication called Vismotigib, uh, which goes with a brand name Arabeg, that is used in some cases of basal cell carcinoma, particularly in cases of, of genetic diseases where there is a risk for basal cell carcinoma, or you know, basal cell carcinoma is a big part of the disease. The outlook for basal cell carcinoma is pretty good though. Uh, most are cured uh, by treatment, but it does have a pretty high recurrence rate. Um, and 50% of people who have a basal cell carcinoma will get another basal cell carcinoma, at least somewhere else, on their body within three years of the first diagnosis. So it requires that you know you have ongoing ongoing surveillance with total body skin exams from your healthcare provider um, on a regular basis, as well as do two self skin checks at home. Uh, prevention is key. Uh, you can do what I tell you to do every day, and that is wear a broad spectrum sunscreen and sun protective clothing. If you have young children, this is key. Uh, because as I said at the beginning of the video, the sun exposure that you have as a young child uh, sets you up for basal cell carcinoma later on in life. Uh, so, I mean, you know, if a child gets a blistering sunburn, that's just that's just a field of DNA mutations in their skin that can definitely put them at risk for skin cancer down the road. Um, you gotta protect your skin on a daily basis, year round, regardless of the weather, even if it's cloudy out. Uh, you know, so long as daylight out, ultraviolet radiation is, is affecting the health of your skin. 
And it's not enough to just wear sunscreen. You have to wear a broad brimmed hat when you're outdoors, long sleeves, and just don't go outside during midday when the sun, ex when sun exposure is, is at its peak. So that's about everything I can tell you about basal cell carcinoma. Comment below and if you want me to do more videos on skin cancers, on squamous cell carcinoma, the other one you gotta worry about. Uh, so with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow, bye.